The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good Monday morning, everybody. I'm Tommy O'Brien coming to you live from TFNN just after 9 a.m. Eastern Time Monday morning. It's Fed Week and the market kicking things off in pretty dramatic fashion. We're accelerating lower right now. You have the S&Ps down 95 points. That's 2.45 percent. The futures are negative right now. You gap lower last night. Gap lower, though. You gapped lower, folks. We've traded 70 points lower, even from that gap. Things open down about 20 to 25 S&P points. They're down about 30 to 35 as of about 7, 7.30, and then you can see the slide. Now, we make lows pre-market at about 4.15 a.m. You did catch a pop of about 20 points. You see the market getting up about 38.20, but as we come into the opening bell, 23 minutes away, 38.06, we have yields rising. You get the 10-year. I believe it hit 3.28% earlier today. We'll see where it's at in a moment, but you have yields rising. You have the two-year actually getting above the 10-year. Is that what happened? I think that's what happened. Uh, we'll pull it up in a moment. Some funky stuff happened with yields. We'll get to that chart in a moment. NASDAQ 100, 3% negative right now, off 354 points. I believe we have one and three quarters percentage point hikes over the next three meetings factored in right now, which basically means 75 potentially coming down the line. You got the Dow off 2%. So we have the Dow off 2%, S&P's off 2.5, NASDAQ 100 off 3%. We got the Russell off 2.6% right now. Boy, quite a weekend, quite a morning in Bitcoin. I don't imagine this is going to be the low, folks, and that's remarkable to say as you're sitting at 23590 There's a lot of stuff going on in crypto that could send this market lower this morning. We'll talk about that in a moment. Crude, holding up relatively well with everything else going on. You got crude sitting at $119 a barrel. You're negative by $1.64 in crude. Last week, we make a high of 123.18. We've backed off a bit, but all things considered, with the sell-off across the board right now, gold off $28.00. 1847 gold was up to 1882 originally on the futures open gold gives it all back to 1846 and we jump to notes and bonds and there is your action now let's jump over real quick uh to see where we're at in the yield right now for the 10 year three point pretty close 3.27 3.265 to be exact we round up 3.27 percent the yield on the 10 year you want to talk about a move folks just from friday you're off two full points. Two full points from where you were Friday morning in the 10 year. My dad's been talking about it, some great calls, man, talking about rates are going higher. And boy, you talk about a move. We blow apart the previous lows in the 10 year. That was a price of 117.08. You now have a 115 handle in the 10 year. And as I said, just from Friday, you were flirting with 118, let alone you go back to just May 25th. That's only like three weeks ago. And the 10-year has just given up, what, almost five, six full points in the 10-year as we're now sitting at 3.26%. Remarkable acceleration across the board right now. You get the 30-year off a full point and 14 ticks. That's below previous lows as well. You talk about a move. The 30-year just traded, what, nah, full, full, four full points. The 10-year really getting some action here. The short end of the curve really getting some action. And yes, Let's jump over. The two-year Treasury yield briefly topped the 10-year. That's what it was. The first inversion since early April. There's your headline. Uh, yes, this is your spread. Okay, so that inversion taking place at about 5 in the morning. Let's see where our 10-year was at that time. The two-year, the 10-year. About four in the morning, things continue, continue to accelerate. That's probably what happened, as in you saw the 10-year continue to rise. That gets the spread back. But you see, they're basically right now trading pretty similar action. Uh, yeah, with the two-year at about 3.22 and the 10-year at about 3.26%. Remarkable, man, across the board. All right, let's get into a little Bitcoin and Ethereum, man. And we could spend a whole show on this one. 
Okay, we we'll kick it off with Bitcoin. Let's take a look at Bitcoin on a weekly. Folks, that is a decisive break of a very important technical area. Okay, you talk about a move. That move, I have this on my chart. I drawn it. I'm not even sure when. Did I tell you when I drew it? Maybe I drew it May 5th because that's the day it was ending. Uh, nonetheless, pretty easy area to see of support. And you talk about a gap away. And folks, I've been saying it. You go below this 30,000 area, 10,000 is probably coming at you because it was a one way trip from October of 2020 to really the end of the year. You got up to 42,000. You went from 10,000 to 42,000 in the span of about two to two and a half months. OK, there's no reason why I can't give it up technically back to 10,000. Fundamentally, it's a big problem as well. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Now, Ethereum, that's a low. Yeah, that's as low as far back as the charts go on the Thinkorswim platform, which is February of 2021. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe that's when futures started trading on Ethereum, which is why they're up there. Uh, not sure exactly of the fundamentals, but no matter what, Ethereum was pushing 5,000 towards the end of last year. You were at a recent high in April of 3,600, just like that Ethereum, 1220 in that market. All right, now let's tease on some of the fundamental action going on in crypto, man. So this is uh, the main culprit out here on top of just everything going on, right? I mean, it's it's almost a perfect storm here for crypto markets accelerating lower, uh, massive loss of wealth, everything that's in the growth sector deteriorating in value. There's nothing more growth oriented than a cryptocurrency that's basically worthless, right? I was trying to think today, at least when you have stocks like Zoom and Roku getting cut by 80% pullback, at least there is some critical value that you can probably assign to that business, especially Zoom. Zoom's actually making money. The multiples got crazy, but they are a profitable company. So there is an earnings per share that relates to the company like Zoom. There is nothing like that with crypto, folks. There's no reason why Bitcoin can't be $500. Tell me why Bitcoin can't be 500. Now, yeah, you're going to make the argument that there's only 20 million Bitcoin in circulation, right? But in theory, you understand the point. So Celsius Network freezes withdrawals. This is some type of crypto lending network is what I believe it is. Uh, Bitcoin tumbled Monday. Cryptocurrency lending company Celsius Network froze withdrawals and transfers citing extreme conditions in the latest sign of how financial market turbulence is causing distress. That triggered a huge slide, of course. Bitcoin trades lower. They offer interest-bearing products to customers who deposit cryptocurrencies at its platform. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. I think they were pushing 16 to 18%. Folks, when you see something too good to be true, it usually is, and it almost always is. You're seeing that play out over and over and over in crypto. Uh, I'm going to pull up some of the quotes. Maybe they're in here. Are they? Um, Celsius raised $750 million in funding late in November from investors. They just basically went BK probably, folks. Uh, now, this gets even further, okay? Because we're going to tease as we get into this break. And I'm just pulling stuff uh, as this story is breaking, folks. And I don't have the fundamental knowledge in this arena to confirm this stuff. But now you get that Celsius moved more than a quarter billion dollars to FTX before halting withdrawals. So people are saying, were they moving around money before they did that? And then we get into Binance. That's right. We're going to talk about it. We'll be right back, folks. In a time of booming inflation, where your purchasing power is eroded, there's no better place to protect your hard-earned money than in gold. Vista Gold's flagship asset is the Mount Todd Gold Project in the Northern Territory of Australia. This is Australia's largest undeveloped gold project. We are talking a world-class gold project in a Tier 1 mining district. This is a large-scale, low-cost project with significant existing infrastructure in a politically safe and friendly mining jurisdiction. Vista Gold just completed the Mount Todd Feasibility Study, which resulted in a 7 million ounce gold reserve in a 16-year mine life. All of this combined with the approvals of all major operational as well as environmental permits. This distinguishes Mount Todd as an attractive, de-risk partner, ready development stage gold project. Vista Gold trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol VGZ.
Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything, from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at tfnn.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. Welcome back, folks. So we jump right into it, finishing up. So the headline story out there is that Celsius, a lending crypto firm that was offering interest rates of 16 to 18 percent on deposits, just stops doing business for right now as they're not going to process withdrawals. They freeze the network. Then you have a story about Binance we'll get into, but this story out there as well, talking about, you know, you can keep track through the ledger of some of the transactions. It'd be interesting to see how this comes out, that they were moving some of the money out of Celsius to an exchange FTX before they were halting those withdrawals. Uh, they are supposedly pausing those withdrawals to quote unquote stabilize liquidity. Although, Speculators, of course, saying maybe they've been moving large amounts of whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptos while simultaneously pausing withdrawals for users. And then you get into the fact that, where is it? Yeah, Binance CEO says that they are temporarily pausing of Bitcoin withdrawals on Binance due to a quote-unquote stuck transaction causing a backlog. Not sure how that plays out fundamentally in terms of the reality of that being the actual case or not, okay? Now, when you get into it, folks, you talk about companies. I got to find, I got so many articles up here, uh, but you talk about MicroStrategy. Yeah, here it is. This is, no, that's not it either. Yes, here it is. Okay. So MicroStrategy, right? They got all the Bitcoin. They're down pretty dramatically, of course, with that going on. What was their symbol? MSTR? Yep, that's going to be it. You're down to 144 today. Okay, from 200, so you're going to take, what is that, 25, uh, 20, 27, 28% loss? Don't touch this thing, folks, okay, because here's what you got to know. The CFO of MicroStrategy on a potential margin call, 21,000 is the red line that they got to put up more money, folks, and we might be there in no time, man, okay? So the CFO said during the first quarter conference call when 21,000 was probably – at least something they were hoping was not coming into fruition, uh, that only the Bitcoin purchased against its stockpile were subject to a margin call. Now, the risk of really are that we would have to contribute more Bitcoin. Now, as you can see, we mentioned previously, we have a quite of uncollateralized Bitcoin. So we have 95,000 unencumbered Bitcoin. So we have more that we could contribute in the case that we have a lot of downward volatility, which we're having today. 
But again, we're talking about 21000 before we get to a point where there needs to be more margin or more collateral contributed. They're having a discussion this morning, folks, about more collateral for MicroStrategy. You're seeing the stock down almost 30% right now. You take a look at the longer term chart. So you're opening at 140, okay, which is basically where we had liftoff. I mean, look at 140 is September of 2020, folks. Bitcoin was trading at 10,000 in October, okay? So Bitcoin's trading at 24,000 right now, and this thing's gonna be trading back to September prices. I would not be touching this thing right now. Anytime you're dealing with a borderline case of potential margin calls in the crypto sector. Now, I don't understand the fundamentals well enough, but I do understand what goes on in that industry left and right to know well enough that when you have a crypto firm saying they have all this Bitcoin that's unencumbered, okay, they are a public company, so that's supposed to be accurate. But man, there's a lot of ways that you can play funny money with these cryptos. And what happens when they need to make some margin calls? And what happens, folks, if they don't want to put those Bitcoin up? Or what happens if somebody's not going to give you the collateral you once thought 95,000 Bitcoin was? Okay, 95,000 Bitcoin, whenever they were having this conversation, was probably worth almost 50% more than it's worth right now. I'm not sure of the date of this, but I'm just even saying if you go from 30,000 to 20,000, right, those 95,000 Bitcoin lose 33% of the value, but then Bitcoin would have to go up 50% to come back to that same price level. So you don't have as much collateral as you had because your collateral is crypto. Crypto is crashing, and your whole point is that you're going to be able to use your crypto to collateralize the crypto you've borrowed to buy. Really think about that before you ever think about investing in this company, folks. Yeah, you're going to see some bounces, I'm sure, along the way. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but 21000 if 21000 creates a margin call crisis for this company, you think there's any traders out there that would love to push crypto, uh, Bitcoin, down to at least that price point to see what starts happening and to see maybe if they get some forced liquidation? In terms of micro strategy, that's what I would try and do. I mean, you got players all over the world, folks. All right, market manipulation is illegal, but I don't even know how that plays out in crypto. I don't even think that's the case in crypto. I'm sure the SEC might have a different debate on that, but you get the point. Okay, micro strategy, they're in big trouble, man. They got margin calls at twenty one thousand. Bitcoin just crashed to twenty three thousand three eighty, and as I put it on this chart, man. You're basically probably going right back to 10,000. There's nothing in the way, folks. You gap higher, you gap and lower. This thing's been having support for the better part of a year and a half at this 30,000 price level. And just like that, you go south. Now, let's check out Coinbase this morning. And how about the market getting Coinbase out at basically, uh, you know, all time highs. 429, you're going to open today at 45, folks. That doesn't have today's action. That's a weekly chart down from 350 late last year. And there's your drop off of Coinbase. Now, the same thing with Coinbase goes. Okay, they've talked about the bankruptcy is not going to happen. I don't know if it is, but there's no way I'm touching anything with Coinbase ever again by the fact that if they ever do go BK, a client funds become general creditors just like you would if you had loaned that company money. OK, never, ever would I put my money in that exchange ever again after those words were put into their quarterly filing for Coinbase. It's going to be a tough one on the open, folks. The S&Ps are down 100 points right now. You're down 3802. Uh, so much for 3800. This is a critical level when you take a look at where we are. We got there in three weeks, man. In like nothing. We were trading at 4200. You give up 400 S&P points in not three weeks. Yeah, because this is two weeks, two weeks in today is where we got there, and this is the level we bounced from last time. You know, you want to talk about, you put this thing on a four-hour chart, okay? You go back to where we were here, and we just got below that price level. The lows on a four-hour basis was 38.07. We're trading right now at 38.04. I think we may have gotten below that price level intraday. But you're seeing it in the S&P, and we're right back to a critical Fibonacci level. You trade below here, 3,500s the next price point that the S&P, and we'll see how it would trade there. The interesting part there is you do have some consolidation in the later part of 2020 at about 3,500 for the S&Ps. Uh, we'll see where we go. NASDAQ 100, pretty similar in terms of the S&Ps. You're now back to where it was, the 50%. Now, the dicey area here is this is the consolidation area, if you want to even call it that, along that one-way trip up that the NASDAQ 100 had. 
But about 12,000 could have been an area for support. That's where you bounced a few weeks ago for the lows of May. That's where you had a couple tops. You could have resistance turning it to support. We're at 11,500. NASDAQ's 100 is down 3.1% right now. Crazy action, folks. And yeah, so the two-year had briefly topped the 10-year. Let's jump back as we come into the break year and we come back for the opening bell. You talk about a day in the markets, folks. You got the 10-year down a full point right now. 115.26. And we're probably talking about markets as we're right back. Yields above 3.28%. We're going to see 3.3% today. We saw probably saw it down here. 3.3%. We're going to see 3.5% soon in the 10-year. Stay tuned, folks. We got the opening bell coming up in three minutes. We'll be right back. If you want to take advantage of this sector, now is the time to subscribe to my Gold Report. The Gold Report is a comprehensive look at the metal sector as well as the markets that move gold, which is the currency and bond markets. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Every Monday morning, I publish the Gold Report with coverage of gold, silver, bonds, the XAU, HUI, GDX, as well as more than 30 different mining equities. To see for yourself the types of profitable trades that are recommended within the Gold Report, sign up now by visiting TFNN.com. Don't miss out on the next great gold trade. Sign up today. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. TFNN is excited about our new software charting program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts. In collaboration with Tom O'Brien and using his best-selling book, The Art of Timing the Trade, Your Ultimate Trading Mastery System, David White has programmed an outstanding piece of software that will complement any trader's methodology. Using this first-of-its-kind program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts allows you to scan thousands of stocks for Fibonacci formation setups, including Gartley's, ABC's, Butterflies, and much more. The Art of Timing the Trade Charts is designed to help you when scouring the markets for stocks just beginning to form the trading patterns that many investors spend days, weeks, or even months searching to find. And right now, we're offering licenses available at only $79 a month. We are so confident that you're going to love this new charting software that will even give you a 30-day unconditional money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible new piece of software. Get your copy of The Art of Timing the Trade Charts today by visiting tfnn.com. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. We got markets open, and you have the S&P opening down 100 points on the dot at 3802. We're trading right now down 2.5% in the S&Ps, trading down an even 3% in the NASDAQ 100, and you were trading down 2.1% in the Dow. Russell right now off 2.7%. Bitcoin opens the session down 19% at down $5,500, we'll call it. Ethereum down 27%. Talk about an acceleration, man. 12.14. Crude holding up relatively well at 119 right now. We got some dollar strength today. We got rising yields. You got the gold contract pulling back negative $37 right now at 18.38. And there's your 10-year note and bond. You got the 10-year right back to near the session lows. And we did. We just hit 
3.31% on the 10-year yield, the highest since November of 2018. Jumping back to those charts uh, in terms of the numbers that we were at, in terms of three-year, one-year, two-year, five, 10, and 30. Excuse me, you see the two-year, 3.22. The one-year, 2.68. Look at the jump that these things have had just in the last session. You get the one year and the two year up about 17 basis points, the 10 year up about 13 basis points, the 30 year up about 11 basis points. Man, these moves, the Fed, uh, it's gonna be an interesting press conference on Wednesday. Are they gonna come with, what are they gonna come with, man? Are they gonna come with 50? It's definitely a discussion. They're gonna come with 175. And let's get over to that conversation. Bond yield surge with Fed bets, well, Curve flags recession risk. Yeah, because you get in, right? The 30-year right now, only at 3.3. The 10-year is only at 3.2. Meanwhile, you get the 5-year at 3.4. You have the 2-year inching towards the 10-year yet again across the board. Uh, markets price in 175 points of Fed tightening by December decision. The 2-year had jumped to the highest since 2017 on that number. And you got the yield curve inverted. As the Treasury futures volume leaped on increasing concern that tighter monetary policy will take a bigger toll on economic growth. Uh, and yeah, 75 is in the, the conversation, folks. Markets are pricing in 250. I mean, it's just amazing to say for where we've come and how we've been used to free money for so long. The market is pricing in 50 basis points, 50 basis points, and 75 basis points at the next three meetings. That's following a hike of already 50 basis points and 25 to kick things off. Boy, they're late to the party, man. 25 to kick things off. I understand the war was raging. That was the concern. That probably gave them a bit of pause on a, on a liftoff of greater than 25. But that's a decision that obviously was late to the party. Uh, the Fed has not hiked by three quarters of a percent since 1994. They haven't done the 75. That's going to be a lot of the conversation, I imagine, in the press conference. We'll see what Chairman Powell has to say. If they hike on 75, why is he doing it? Okay, what's the next course? Is 75 on the table on the next meeting? If they don't hike at 75, we'll see where that goes. I don't know, man. This, this market, this inflation, I was talking about on Friday, the CPI number comes in hot. And, I mean, I talked about it's almost a little bit of a game changer. Now, game changer, we, we might have been there already, as in the game did get changed. The game got changed to the tune of 350 S&P points, folks. I can't even believe I'm saying it. 350, I'm ballparking, all right? You want to be exact? 41.44 to 37.98. What is that? 346 S&P points over the span of basically 48 hours of trading. You're talking about from early Thursday to early Monday, right? We got two full trading days and an overnight session in there, and you give up 350 S&P points. Whew, man. So, yeah, that's an 8 what, 9% haircut in this index just over since where we were at 7 a.m. on Thursday. That may be the repricing of a different game, as in the market trades lower on Thursday, comes into the CPI with a little bit of fear, Things are confirmed for that fear, and we have inflation that actually has peaked in June. The whole rhetoric was that potentially we had peaked in March. That's not the case. <coughs> Excuse me. We had peaked in June. Well, that's as of now. Where do we go from here? Are these rate hikes going to have the effect that the Fed wants them to? I'm not sure. Man, we got a lot of influences in this market right now having to do with war, having to do with energy prices. Uh, having to do with just electric prices, heating overall. And then you have supply chain issues going on with whether it's the war going on, with whether it's uh, still disruptions from COVID going on. It's not a normal market, folks, where financials and pricing is just trading off of the cost of money in terms of interest rates. That is not what's going on. I'm sure the Fed understands that, whether they understand that to the degree of what's actually happening. I think none of us really no until we see this play out um, and, and and we see that forward progress, right? I mean, it's a great point. Yeah, and talk about unemployment rises. We have such a strong job market. That is going to lead to wage increases, rightfully so, because costs are extremely high. 
So that's going to lead to wage increases. This is a very tight labor market. And as long as you have dramatic wage in increases going on and you have everything else going on with energy and with food prices, which I know isn't in the core number, but the core number was still at, what, six something percent. OK, airfare is through the roof. There are things that are through the roof that a 50 basis point hike isn't going to bring down. The Fed's not going to hike by 75 basis points on Wednesday, folks. And. Delta all of a sudden is going to drop their fares by 20%, which will contribute to the CPI number. That's not what's going to happen. So that's the worry right now in this market. Now, we get over to some of the risks. Goldman and Morgan Stanley, surprise, surprise, they tell us now that stocks don't fully reflect the risks. I would say they didn't reflect them that well at all at 4150 Okay, 3800 it's a little bit fairer. At least a little bit more fair, I should say. Uh, depressed consumer is a key risk to the U.S. market. Equity valuations are far from depressed. That's Goldman's cost in talking about. Uh, even after the sell-off, equities are not fully reflecting the risks. I've been talking about it before, folks. You don't have to predict a recession, okay? You have to. All you have to do is assign a probability to the range of events that could occur. It's it's. To relate it back to poker, okay, because I played a lot of poker, and there's similar actions that were gambling on the market, folks. If you're trading long-term long investing, take some of that gambling out of it. You're still putting money at risk for future profits, but you put your money in a valuable company. There will be volatility, and in the long run, that company will grow. In the short term, a lot of it's gambling. And in poker, you have unknowns, okay? You don't know what the holdings are of your opponent. OK, so you can't be certain people or people say, uh, you know, I knew he had a bluff here or something like that. And I called or I knew you had pocket aces and that's why I folded. OK, well, what you do is you assign a probability. You say, OK, there's a 25 percent chance this person has this range of hands. There's a 25 percent chance this person has this range of hands and there's a 50 percent chance that they have nothing and they're bluffing. In the market, you should be assigning OK, there's a 25 percent chance that inflation rages for the next six months. The Fed can't get it under control. They really ramp things up to just absolutely crush inflation and hurt the market. But it's worth it. Get things back in tow. You know, you assign a probability to the range of events that can occur. And that is the way you want to look at things as opposed to trying to know that you're going to be right because we're all going to be wrong, folks. OK, so you have to assign probabilities. And you have to at least understand, and I think we all do, it's tough to recognize in your head, that there's at least a probability here that things are very, very difficult over the next year. That inflation persists, energy prices persist, services sector is still on fire, causing raise, rising prices in the service sector, right? And meanwhile, we're sitting at 3,800. We're just back to where we started the year, last year in 2021, folks. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you in the market for buying or selling real estate in the Bay Area, including the surrounding St. Petersburg, Tampa, and Clearwater markets? Tiger Real Estate LLC is a firm that has extensive experience in the Tampa Bay Area. Whether you're looking to sell your current property for maximum value or you're in the market for a second home or investment property, Tiger Realty has the experience across all areas of real estate in the Tampa Bay Area to help buyers and sellers sellers make the most informed decisions across all price levels. From the price you should be paying per square foot in certain up-and-coming areas to the type of cash flow investment properties are capable of creating, Tiger Real Estate can help you make the best decision when it comes to all areas of the market. Before you make one of the biggest decisions of your financial future, call Tiger Real Estate LLC today at 727-329-8322 or email us at tiger at tfnn.com. That's 727-329-8322. 229-8322. Call us today. The technology around us is changing every day. With so much happening, it can seem impossible to keep up with all the information. David White's investment newsletter, The Technology Insider, is designed to give you all the information you need to understand the technology that shapes today's markets and tomorrow's future. David White has made his living staying on the cutting edge of technology. His weekly newsletter will give you specific recommendations for value tech stocks, as well as entry prices, target prices, and stops to set for each trade. Dave delivers his weekly newsletters every Friday with updates throughout the week. You can get the Technology Insider at TFNN.com for only $37.50. Sign up for Dave's newsletter, The Technology Insider, and get an inside look at everything the technology sector has to offer. 
Try it risk-free today with our 30-day money-back guarantee. TFNN, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor for Side Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. We're uh, taking a look at ARC. ARC down another 6.4% right now, checking out some of their largest holdings. You have Zoom shares down 4.4% right now. Uh, Roku, another one of their biggest positions, down 7.4% right now. Think about the move that this thing had to 105. Be careful in these equities, folks. You can put some money into them. Uh, you're trading with high volatility. This is some high volatility market gambling you have going on in these equities. What I will say is, the reason why that thing popped up last week was on the talk that potentially, I guess, people are talking about at, what was it, at Roku that they might be acquired by Netflix or maybe at Netflix they were talking about they might acquire Roku. A lot of speculation, not a lot of details. You're back to $76. Remarkable that you are back to basically COVID lows for this equity. You jump over to the Analyze tab and you talk about a company valued at $10 billion right now. At some point, they will become attractive, folks, because they are the gatekeeper for something like 66 million households. They have it in here? Maybe they do. I'll try and pull it up at the next break uh, in terms of the number of customers that they have. Now, I'm biased because I'm a customer. I got like four or five Rokus in my house, one in each in each bedroom. Uh, but if you're gambling and you're thinking you have it, you're down 7% today, even from where you were last week. So if the market falls apart... Roku is going to fall apart along with Zoom, along with all of these growth stocks. And you're seeing that happen this morning, down another 6.7%. Now, checking out Kathy Woods, her positions. Now, I noticed when I went to the trades, she was even adding to Roku, which was interesting. So you see the trades listed here. Twilio, she had some action in. What is you? What's that equity? Unity Technologies uh, and Roku. So 135,000 shares of Roku. And what's Roku trading at right now? 77 bucks. So not bad. She puts that into it, increases that fund weighting. In terms of Roku, you go back to the holding. Zoom's been number one for a while now when it overtook it from Tesla. And Roku, now number two in terms of... Yeah, I'm just looking at what this represents. Okay, this represents the fund weighting. What I'm trying to figure out here, which gives me pause, and again, I'm not sure of the complete accuracy, maybe it's updated, that somehow Roku is listed second here, but the market value, maybe this is because of today. That's probably what it is. Yeah, because Roku's down so much that it has the number two spot as of the close of Friday, probably, but that market valuation in terms of where it's trading at right now, no, because that's trading at 8271. Maybe it's repricing it. It's at 77 right now. Let's see how Tesla's trading. Nonetheless, Tesla down 4.3%. 666. Watch out for that 666 in Elon, man. Down 4.3% for Tesla shares. We jump over to Twitter. See how some of the other equities. Twitter down about 2.4% right now. Facebook shares. Oh, no longer. Meta. Excuse me. Meta shares down 2.4% right now. Amazon down 3.6%. Amazon, man. You talk about a pullback from where it traded to. My goodness. 128.99. You're at 105 this morning for Amazon. Uh, I'm a big believer in Amazon in the long run, folks. You jump over to some of the other FANG stocks. Google shares down 2.1%. Microsoft down 2.2%. We jump to the big dog, Apple. 
down 2% as well. All right, let's jump around to some good news for the economy. Movies are back. Jurassic World. Unfortunately, critics coming out saying this may be the worst one in the franchise. Uh, there have been some great Jurassic Parks, Jurassic World, uh, but there have been some horrible ones too. So for this one to be the worst might not be uh, too enjoyable. To say the least, but nonetheless, it's a big blockbuster. 143.3 million in domestic opening. Top Gun Maverick, they add another 50 million. Uh, I think I saw that. I mean, Top Gun, you're talking about maybe pushing 600 million. Uh, I'll try and pull that number so far. I think it had grossed about 308 million prior to this past weekend. Pulls in another 50 million, at least domestically, in terms of that number. Now, what they do say in here is that internationally, Jurassic World has already taken in 245. They brought the total to 390, just like that. My friends and I were joking about the, the movie saying, yeah, it's supposed to be horrible. What a bummer. It'll still probably take in a billion dollars. It's remarkable, man. You just do those big budget movies uh, and you get the, the value from them. You had almost 11 million people coming up to see it. Around 66% of overall audience saw that one movie. Now, what they say in here, though, Maverick has continued to draw in audiences. That's Top Gun. Just a 44% drop in ticket sales between its second and third week. That's not that uh, steep of a drop-off. Usually there can be a cliff sometimes. Opening weekend, second weekend, third, you know, you're barely left. And they talk about because this video has seen, yeah, I'll get the quote. However, this game of diminishing returns could be much more severe for Jurassic World. They've received overwhelmingly negative reviews from critics and could see a steep drop-off in ticket sales after its opening weekend if word of mouth from moviegoers is also sour. Uh, I imagine Top Gun's going to have some staying power. Yeah, I, I, you know, I haven't seen Top Gun yet. I want to go see it in the movie theaters. I love Jurassic World, Jurassic Park. I love those movies. I'm probably not going to check it out. It is mis interesting how word of mouth, right? Maybe I'll go... Um, the kids are a little young still to, to really sit there for a two, two and a half hour movie. We've got a five year old, Tommy, of course, um, 16 months old. He's not quite there yet, especially for a Jurassic Park movie, but not quite there. So maybe not even quite for the kids. So I'll just wait till that one comes in some streaming service or pay for it online. Um, but Top Gun, I want to go see that one in the theaters, man. It's supposed to be a good one. Tom Cruise, check it out. Why not? All right, getting back to energy. So the conversation has been higher energy prices in Texas. They're going to feel it, man. Using all-time record as heat bakes the state. It's hot, folks. It's hot and flouter. I know it's hot across the country right now. Uh, de demand surpassed the record set in August. Underscores the searing heat, rampant population growth. Boy, I hope Pep Texas is doing something to get that under control, man, because it's only June 13th, folks. We got July and August left, and those are usually all the hottest months of the summer. And the record they passed was in August. OK, 74.9 gigawatts sounds like back to the future. Right. How many how many gigawatts? Uh, the grid's operating normal, though, and officials say there's ample supplies to meet demand. One gigawatt is enough to power about 200,000 Texas homes. So you got to multiply that by almost 75 in terms of what they're putting out right there. The record underscores that heat that they have coming up, though. Texas regularly tops 100 degrees. It's early in the season. That's what I'm talking about, man. If this is going to be a rough one. Dallas hit 105 on Sunday. Houston's going to be 100, and Midland will be 103. Whew. We got some humidity in Florida, man. You go outside any time of the day, you're going to be sweating, but we don't have that type of heat. We get up to about 92 degrees, 93 degrees, maybe 94, um, and you know the humidity brings it to a feels like that's like 118 or something silly. Um, but yeah. For the good, lovely people of Texas, man, I hope that plays out in a good way because it is life or death, folks. 240 people died when you had uh, the system collapse during a winter storm. That was a result of the power grid failing, and uh, they have reforms. We'll see how that plays out. Texas, I mean, they get their own power grid, right? They're not attached to everybody else, and as a result, uh, they cannot turn on and off some of that excess supply when they need it most. So we'll see. That's a big number. All right, this one's just interesting from a perspective of whether it's your retail own perspective, but you know, there are gonna be some sales out there, folks, and it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out for the secondary retailers like Overstock, uh, maybe the likes of Marshalls, stuff like that. 
because uh, you're going to have some excess inventory. There's going to be some sales. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get here. We'll talk a little bit about the dollar as well. So you're going to have some earnings. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. We have markets basically where you open. You're looking at an S&P down an even 100 points right now, trading at 3801. NASDAQ 100, you're off 2.8%. The Dow's off 600 points. That's just shy of 2% right now. We jump to crypto, man. Bitcoin, 23,625. You make it to a low of 23,270. Ethereum is down 26% at 1231. Gold contract right now down $41. There's a move for you on Friday. Gives it all back today. It's going to be an interesting day in the markets, folks. We jump over to Tesla again real quick. Tesla shares down 5.1%. Don't forget, they have a lot of Bitcoin, I think, as well still. Uh, where am I? Come on. There we go. This is the article I wanted. Elon Musk's regulatory woes mount as U.S. moves closer to recalling Tesla's self-driving software. This is a Fortune article, I believe, written on Friday. The one point I was going to point out, uh, a friend had shared this tweet earlier. The U.S. inquiry to probe suspicions that Tesla's autopilot is designed to auto-quit when crash is imminent. We'll see how this plays out. One of the things that the Fortune article makes a point of is that it would be very difficult for Tesla to be held accountable because... Most of uh, their software is still seen as assistant. And the current autonomous feature 
are deemed assistant systems in which the driver is liable at all times. But here's what I will say, man. When you see Elon say that autopilot was not engaged at the time of an accident, check out this, okay? 16 separate instances, and this is a quote from that Fortune article, okay? When this occurred, that autopilot aborted vehicle control less than one second prior to the first impact. So you have autopilot on, it aborts it just prior to the accident. Basically, probably, I don't even know. I'm not going to assign basically probably, okay? It could be for horrible reasons, as in they know that right before it, if they abandon autopilot, they can say that autopilot was not engaged at the time of an accident. But maybe autopilot disengages because that's when the user is supposed to take over if it's an assistance. That is what Tesla would probably say. The one thing that I really took from this is that when he says it wasn't engaged at the time of an accident, that might be an erroneous, uh, misleading statement at best. Tesla down 4.8%, man. Stay tuned, folks. It's going to be a wild one. S&P's down 2.5%. Thanks so much for starting your day with me. Stay tuned. We got Basil up next. We'll be right back. Thanks.